Hello friends, I have been using the Sony Alpha 7 R4 for several months now. If you follow me regularly, you'll know that this is the first Sony body that I have purchased. If you are new here, a quick primer on where I'm coming from. I was a loyal Nikon shooter for many, many years until I started this channel over 10 years ago. That's when I broadened my horizons and started using other brands, purchasing some, borrowing others, I've developed an appreciation for all of the brands and in talking with you all on a daily basis for over 10 years, I've developed an appreciation for the broad range of wants and needs among different photographers. So when I review gear, I always make sure to keep it neutral. I will share my opinions as well as facts about the camera and a whole lot of my own photos and video, but I will mention throughout my review, the practical use of any specification or feature. That way, you can begin to draw your own conclusion on this gear, in this case, the Alpha 7 R4. Really quickly before we dive in, a quick commercial break from me. I have announced my next photography tour. It is to Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks. It is coming up very soon in May of 2020. I will put a link up above and in the description to where you can learn more about it. There was an error in pricing when I first announced the trip, but it has been corrected. So you may want to recheck the page, uh, even if you've already looked at it. I hope you can join us. Okay, back to the review. The Sony Alpha 7 R4 was made available in mid-2019 and Raymond, my partner here in Snapchick land, went to Sony's launch event and he came back saying that this was the camera that convinced him on buying into the Sony ecosystem. I went into this fully expecting to come home to the cameras that we own and really not think twice about this camera. But I keep thinking about the Mark IV a lot. Now, I had been partially convinced when I tried the Alpha 7 R3, and then using a couple other Sony bodies sold me that they had come a long way since I tried the Alpha 7 many years ago. So we have purchased an Alpha 7 R4 as our first Sony body, along with a handful of lenses, the vertical grip, and a microphone that was introduced at the same time as the body. We still have and use our other gear. In fact, I am filming this video with my Nikon Z7 right now, but for me and how I work in both photo and video, the Sony has become my go-to when I just need to get the work done. Raymond said this last year and it still holds true today. The Sony Alpha 7 R4 is the most technologically advanced camera we have ever used. The competition is working on getting to the point where Sony is in terms of technology like autofocus detection and tracking, speed and responsiveness, but they aren't there yet. Sony continues to innovate with things like animal eye detect autofocus and real-time tracking autofocus. None of this means that you can't get phenomenal results from nearly any modern camera. It doesn't mean that everyone should purchase the Sony Alpha 7 R4. All of the major brands are better than ever. Every single one can deliver great images as long as you know how to use the camera and you focus on your timing, light, and location. However, when you want the most help and the most useful features, the most resolution in the case of the Alpha 7 R4, the most flexibility to shoot the way that you want, Sony is the leader of the pack. For me, it is the most efficient while allowing me to express my creativity in any way that I can come up with. 
I enjoy using all sorts of cameras, but this one is probably my most reliable in the most situations. I'm gonna say this again though, you do not need a Sony camera to capture good photos or video. This Alpha 7 R4 is not the camera for every single person out there. What you need and what is the most technologically advanced does not need to be the same thing. <laughs> not everyone has the same needs. Not to mention the fact that you have to enjoy using the camera or at least in the case of working with your camera, you have to make peace with it. So technologically advanced does not necessarily mean right for you. Now that I've said how technologically advanced this camera is, let's discuss the specs for a minute. I'm throwing a bunch of them up on the screen right now, though I won't discuss every single one in this video. It would simply take way too long. <laughs> Here's the skinny though. The Alpha 7 R4 is a mirrorless interchangeable lens camera. It has a 61 megapixel full frame sensor. That's a lot of pixels. It is the most pixels ever on a full frame sensor by quite a bit. But along with all of that resolution, the camera is able to maintain a snappiness that is pretty amazing. You can shoot still frames at up to 10 frames per second with autofocus and auto exposure. To maintain that kind of speed, you do need to consider your memory card though. The Sony will hold two UHS-2 SD cards. For those of you that like to record your images concurrently to two cards or need the extra capacity, that will make you happy. The native ISO range is 100 to 32,000. From a technical standpoint, Sony is a tech company, so they do not disappoint. <laughs> but enough about these specs. I will bring some of those back up during the video and probably some others as well, but let's move on. Let's go ahead and start with focus. This is where I personally find the Sony cameras to stand out among the crowd. The camera has 567 phase detection autofocus points and a range of 325 to 425 contrast detection autofocus points, depending on the focus mode that you're using. That means that you end up having coverage nearly across the frame. The Alpha 7 R4 isn't unique in having a ton of autofocus points across the frame, but it is a big improvement if you are coming from a camera that is at least several years old. And I had zero issues focusing the camera in any given situation, including low light. Along with that, the reliable detection and tracking features make it so that the camera gets out of my way, so to speak. I'm not fumbling with focus. I can simply get the shots I want. Now that being said, you do have to learn the autofocus modes and how to use them. As you would expect with a Sony camera, there are a lot of options that you can customize. I will get back to that idea later in this video, but I learned the options, figured out how I like to use them, and now I'm able to trust the camera to get focus when I need it to. Some of the things that I have come to rely on are the detection and tracking. There is face and eye detection and even face registration and priority for face and eye detection. Basically, that means that you can tell the camera to focus on faces and or eyes in still photo and video. You can tell it to focus on the right eye or the left eye or have it decide. This detection works very well. I've been relying on it every time I have people in my photos and videos. It was especially helpful when I took some family portraits involving a toddler who was not going to be able to sustain a long sitting. <laughs> I got a ton of photos inside of 20 minutes because I trusted the camera to grab onto their faces and get focus. I was able to concentrate on entertaining the toddler so he was looking at me and getting my shots composed. Then there's the face registration and priority that goes along with detection. You can store photos of people in the camera and then assign a priority to a certain person. So if you're doing a group shot or a shot of one person, but there are other people around, you can choose the one person that you always want to make sure is in focus. I've only done initial testing with this feature, but I don't know of any other brands that have it. I can see where it could be helpful in the same way that face and eye detect are helpful. 
they assist you to get the shots that you want more quickly. The autofocus tracking is the most consistently accurate of any camera I have used. For example, this bird. It started to fly by, I raised my camera, placed the bird in my tracking focus point, and it grabbed onto it and tracked it while I just mashed down the shutter release to test it out. Focus stayed on the bird. Really cool. Now another interesting thing Sony has included in this camera is animal eye detection autofocus. It works pretty well, but you do have to set the camera to either human or animal eye detection. And not all animals will register. Like the camera didn't pick up the eyes of the bunnies at the park, but it did pick up the jackrabbits. In fact, sometimes the human eye detect would catch the jackrabbit eyes. The few birds I tried didn't register. I haven't done an extensive test though. So take my experience for what it is. I played around with what is a relatively minor feature of the camera for me at this point. And so far I'm impressed, but I suspect that Sony will continue to improve upon it so that it is more reliable for more animals. And that is a really exciting idea. I take all of my wildlife photos in the wild, which means that I am often surprised by an animal as I hike around a corner and I have to be quick on the draw to get the photo. Like with the portraits of the toddler, this type of autofocus detection means that more of my concentration will be on settings and composition and there will be more usable photos. While other brands of cameras have different detection modes, a standout feature on the Sony for me is real-time autofocus. The camera uses a lot of fancy detection and algorithms to track an object in the frame, right? It can detect an eye or a face and track it. You can choose an object within the frame and it will track that object, but real-time autofocus combines the two. It will pretty seamlessly transition among eye detect, face detect, and object detect to stay on your subject. That means that if your subject turns away for a moment, the camera is going to be smart enough to stick with the subject and then return to the eye or face when it is available again. This isn't unique to the Alpha 7 R4. It's also available on some of the other Sony cameras. Okay, one last bit about autofocus. A viewer asked me, is the detection and tracking that much better than other brands? And here's what I have to say from personal experience using many brands, including many of the current generation cameras out there. Yes, overall, Sony's detection and tracking technology is more reliable, especially when considering real-time autofocus, and it's also the easiest to use. Now, let me qualify that. I definitely use the eye and face detection and tracking from other brands successfully. I'm using it on the Z7 right now. They're all getting really good. Sony simply has a more mature system and they're consistently working on it. So it keeps getting better. But using other camera brands, I don't always have or even use the detection and tracking modes because I just might not want to. And if I were a slow and steady still image photographer who is going to use a single focus point and do my own tracking with my own eyes and hands, like I know that many of my regular viewers are, then most modern cameras will fit the bill. Frankly, a year ago, I would not have expected to rely on detection and tracking like I do now. I was quite set in my ways, but for me to half press and see the focus area lock onto the subject, pull up eyes and faces when they're recognized and then back to tracking the object when they're not is it's just extremely helpful in certain situations. Birds in flight become almost too easy. Things that traditionally are a huge test of your skills as a photographer can be quite simple on the Alpha 7 R4 and it acts and tracks as I would only faster and better while allowing me to compose my shot and focus on following the moving subject rather than test my own dexterity. Now, do you need the Sony Alpha 7 R4's autofocus capabilities? That's up to you. <laughs> if it's not for you, that's okay. We should all shoot the way we like. Okay, let's move on from autofocus, but this topic is somewhat related. Speed and responsiveness, including things like the buffer. The responsiveness of the camera is on par with the responsiveness of the autofocus. I had no issues whatsoever. 
the camera can shoot at up to 10 frames per second with autofocus and auto exposure. In addition to that, the buffer is great. 68 compressed RAW or JPEG or 30 uncompressed RAW files. And when you do fill up the buffer, you can still do most things on the camera while the buffer is clearing, like make settings changes. Now, I rarely fill up a buffer, it's just my style of shooting, but I want to do a test so that you can see what it sounds like in real time. I have the camera set to compressed RAW, aperture priority, and auto ISO. Still going. Slowing down. Slowing down more. Let's take Take the finger off. Give it a second. I think that gives you a pretty good idea. If that seems like it's enough for you, it's got 45 left to clear. It's still, it clears them really fast. Um, if that seems like enough for you, well, good. As for using the camera for moving subjects, I did make Raymond ride his mountain bike past me over and over again <laughs> to see how the frame rate and the overall use of the camera integrated with the autofocus tracking, especially as the light was getting low. It did great, as I expected. I showed the series of bird images earlier. Here's another short set of images where I used tracking autofocus to lock on to one of these birds. Then I was left with a number of photos in my short burst to choose from, all with varying configurations of their wings flapping, so I was able to get exactly what I wanted. Let's discuss resolution and related topics like image quality and low light performance. Here's an interesting fact. We already know that the Alpha 7 R4 is the highest resolution full frame camera out there at 61 megapixels. But did you realize that if you crop the sensor to APS-C, and it does have a cropped mode, I know that several of you asked me about that, when you use that cropped mode, it's actually one of the highest resolution APS-C cameras on the market. It is in fact tied with a couple of Fuji bodies in the top slot. In APS-C mode, you're working with 26 megapixels. And this is a no compromise resolution solution if that's the one thing that you're really after. Overall image quality is as I would expect from Sony and using Sony lenses. Very, very good. What else can I say? The images, they look wonderful. When using this camera, really as well as most other cameras on the market today, the only things limiting quality are lenses and technique. Where I notice the higher resolution being helpful the most is wildlife photography. I can crop. And it means that even when I'm using my 200 to 600 millimeter lens, I can still capture close up wildlife shots even closer. <laughs> I know that a lot of you out there also love to pixel peep, and if that's you, this might be your dream camera. Now having all of that resolution has some potential drawbacks. Having so many pixels on the sensor means that the pixels are smaller and therefore can gather less light into each pixel. Many of you out there expressed your concern to me that this may mean a degradation of image quality as isosensitivity creeps up. And technically, yes, it would mean that. However, you are only going to notice that noise if you really start zooming in or if you print large prints. It's a trade-off of having all that resolution that enables you to zoom in so much. I have not done any scientific tests on this, though you can take a look at this image shot at high ISO as I zoom in. So I didn't notice any additional noise regularly in my images. Of course, we need to remember that this camera is breaking new ground. We have no other cameras with this high pixel density with which to compare the Alpha 7 R4 images. So whether or not this is important to you is up to you. The high resolution full frame images do mean that these are really big files. The compressed raw images that I typically shoot are right around 62 megabytes. Uncompressed raw images, just about double that. And I've heard people say, maybe even myself from time to time, that storage is cheap. But that's not entirely true. Storage is cheaper than it has ever been, but that doesn't mean that it's cheap. Especially if you back up your images, then you're talking at least 
twice the storage depending on your backup system. So my recommendation here is to just consider how you like to store your images. Do you keep all of the raw files that you capture? Raymond and I actually have recently decided that we need to change up how we've been storing and backing up our images. And that decision was in part due to this camera and the Nikon Z7 as well. We have a lot of files. I'm sure I'll do a video where I do update you on that kind of stuff once we get our process down. Anyway, consider how you plan to store these files. Let's move on to the use of the camera. Two things that I have heard time and again about Sony are that the menus are too complicated and the ergonomics are bad. Now, these are personal preference items with no right or wrong answer, but I'll discuss my thoughts. In general, yes, Sony menus have a lot of options. It can be intimidating. I did not like it when I first tried a Sony camera many years ago, but I ended up being able to spend some time with the Alpha 7 R3 a year or so ago, and I gave it a real shot. I studied the menus so that I understood how they were laid out and where important things were. I learned to utilize the My Menu and the customizable buttons and dials on the body. In fact, you can even customize what shows up on the function menu on this camera. So yes, there is a learning curve to get the most out of any Sony camera. It was daunting at first, but having so many ways to set up the camera for me and how I shoot is most certainly good. I like it because by creating so many customizations to how the camera operates, They've made the process of photography about you and how you want to use the camera. And don't get me wrong, not everyone will want that. For some, it will be too complicated. Some may just want to say, just show me where that ISO button is. <laughs> Others like me say, I know where I want that button, so I'll put it here. And we could certainly debate all day how a menu tree should work or how the buttons should be labeled, but the bottom line is that the items are arranged in logical categories and are easy to navigate if you learn them. I do plan to do an entire video where I show you how I have mine set up. On to ergonomics. This is much the same in terms of personal preference. We are all different. Many viewers out there don't like mirrorless cameras or smaller DSLRs because they don't feel like they're big enough for their big hands. I've talked to big dudes with big burly hands that have no trouble with the Sony grip or any other mirrorless body. I see the smaller mirrorless bodies as a benefit because I do have my camera in my hands a lot. I travel a lot. I hike with my camera often. It's nice to have these smaller and lighter mirrorless systems. Even if I'm using a big lens, I like the compact form factor. If you need more bulk and you are interested in the Alpha 7 R4 or some other mirrorless body, think about a grip. The grip for the Alpha 7 R4 adds quite a bit of size to the body. A few viewers asked about weatherproofing and robustness of the camera. I have had the camera out in snow and rain with no issues. It has definitely gotten a little bit wet. Along with that, I had it out in very cold conditions. The operating temperatures are 32 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit or zero to 40 degrees Celsius. It did fine in below freezing temperatures as long as I was holding onto it or it was around my neck. When it was hanging out on a tripod and right around 14 degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative 10 Celsius, it did have some trouble. It stopped taking photos with the interval timer. To be fair, it was quite a bit below the published operating temperature. And I'm thinking about ways to get around this. As for the camera being robust though, I am, I'm not exactly easy on my cameras. They come with me all over the place, in and out of bags, in and out of the Grand Canyon. I've had no issues. Okay, something else that has Sony cameras standing out amid the mirrorless market is the range of native lenses available. Nikon and Canon are actively building on their mirrorless lens lineup, and I can say from experience that the Nikon S lenses that are coming out for the Z series are phenomenal. I own several, but Sony does have a complete lineup 
of over 50 lenses dedicated to their mirrorless format, and I haven't been disappointed with one yet. And their G Master series, like my 24 millimeter F1.4, are above and beyond the pack. This means that while Nikon is doing initial releases of F1.8 prime lenses, Sony is already likely looking towards their next generation of lenses, given the completeness and competence of the current set. As with autofocus technology, I do think that Nikon and Canon will both get there, and there are other brands doing great things as well, but I'm working with these cameras now, so I need the capabilities now. Where the native lenses come in especially handy is for video, because the lenses are nearly silent when autofocusing during video. Adapted lenses can't necessarily do that. Like I said, Raymond and I use so many different cameras and own different systems, including all of the Nikon Z bodies and a bunch of the new lenses. And we like to adapt lenses to different cameras and bodies. So if you're in the market for a mirrorless camera, I do suggest checking out the lens lineups of the different brands, in addition to looking at the camera bodies themselves, just to make sure that the system is offering what you need. While I'm discussing lenses, this is what my Sony system consists of so far. The Alpha 7 R4, two batteries, this battery grip, which Raymond prefers to use, the 24 mm F1.4 G Master, the 24 70 f2.8 G Master, the 200 600 f5.6 6.3 G, and this Viltrox 85 mm f1.8, which has been impressive. In fact, Sony shares their mount specifications so third party manufacturers can make lenses for the cameras more easily. You'll see all of those lenses that I mentioned in reviews or other videos soon. Jumping into video. In general, I do expect my cameras to do both because this channel is my full-time job. I not only make videos to post here on YouTube, but I also use video to supplement my photos when sharing adventure type videos here. So video with the Alpha 7 R4 is amazing, as you'd expect. You can shoot it up to 4K at 30 frames per second, but also 24 frames per second and other HD resolution options. It will do 1080p at 60 frames per second and then 120p slow motion. Both in the camera and when recording externally, video on this camera is limited to 8-bit. In the vast majority of circumstances, that is completely fine with me. We are seeing 10-bit and even 12-bit now in other camera brands. I have been recording with my Nikon Z6 and Z7 in 10-bit to an external recorder, and because I saw the huge jump in ability to color grade the footage, I think I'm gonna send one of them in for the new 12-bit upgrade. Where I have found 10-bit to be the most beneficial for me is in mixed lighting situations. I can go in and adjust color and post in ways that I am not able to do in 8-bit footage. Like always though, I'm sure Sony will keep moving forward and produce video-oriented variants of this camera that I suspect will squash the competition. I'll bring up in-body image stabilization here. It has applications for both still photography and video. It doesn't disappoint. It is, of course, helpful in low light situations because I can use a slower shutter speed to keep my ISO as low as possible, but I find it the most helpful in handheld video. The place of the Alpha 7 R4 in my own personal camera lineup is the do-it-all camera. So having IBIS means that if I am out and about and I see something that I want to take a quick video of, I don't have to worry about a tripod. I can just switch over to video and go for it. Even if I'm using a telephoto lens like the 200 to 600 millimeter, the camera will use a combination of the IBIS and the stabilization in the lens to help me take usable footage. Now, good stabilization isn't unique to the Alpha 7 R4 or even to Sony in general, but it is something that I need on my do-it-all camera. The battery life is rated to be 530 shots using the viewfinder, but there are so many variables that play into that. I have used the interval timer to do several time lapses and captured nearly a thousand images on one battery with life to spare. So I haven't found battery life to be a hindrance. Also, I am comforted that I can charge via USB-C or micro USB in the field with my battery pack. You can even use the camera plugged in via USB-C or micro USB, which can be helpful for long time lapses or for video. 
And remember the vertical grip for the camera, which holds two batteries, so you are doubling your battery life. Finding criticism for the Alpha 7 R4 takes some digging and pickiness for me. But with any camera, there will invariably be things you wish were slightly different. Those things will vary by person, but let's go through my and Raymond's thoughts. A relatively small thing I wish were different is color science. Neither Raymond nor I love the colors straight out of the Sony. This is not always the case because every photo situation is different, but they tend to saturate the reds too much. You can certainly adjust this in post-processing, at least for still photos and to some extent for video. And I know that if I spent some time, I'd be able to adjust the colors to my liking by customizing a creative style. I do plan to do that. If you try this camera and don't love the colors, but don't want to have to spend time modifying them in camera or in post, it's something to consider. I mentioned this when I discussed video. I do wish the Alpha 7 R4 had the capability to shoot 4K 10-bit, at least external recording. I'm sure there's reasons that it isn't included. This is a lot of resolution to be pushing through 10-bit video. Maybe they couldn't make it work quite yet, or maybe it's just market segmentation, which I also understand. Now, there are a few workflow things that will probably only be applicable to someone that uses their camera every day, or at least a lot. But even if you don't, these are things that you can at least know about. Both SD card slots in the camera are UHS-2, which is awesome. I use the fastest SD cards on the market, the Sony Tough Cards, but the XQD cards in my Nikon Z6 and Z7 are about 33% faster than the Sony Tough SD cards. I do want to qualify that though. I don't necessarily want the XQD cards for camera performance, unless maybe if it would give me 10-bit 4K video. It is when I am transferring images and videos after the fact, where I wish the camera used XQD. Transferring is faster with the XQD cards that I use in my Nikons. Because I shoot nearly every day, including video, often with multiple cameras, the transfer speed is a noticeable difference. Incidentally, it would also help if Sony would put the video files in the same folder as the image files. I have to click around to get them, which just slows me down. Another workflow item is startup time. The Alpha 7 R4 takes longer to start up than I'd like. It's definitely more time than my Nikon Z cameras. This is similar to the issue with XQD versus SD cards though. It's not really a big deal, but I do often keep the camera off when it's hanging around my neck and the startup time has probably prevented me from getting a few wildlife shots. It's just something that I have to be mindful of. Now, obviously none of the things that I mentioned prevented me from purchasing the camera, but we're all different. And maybe one of those things is your deal breaker. With the Sony Alpha 7 R4 and any other camera that we review, we do our best to be fair and balanced. The real struggle with the Sony is finding things that it doesn't do better than the other brands. It sounds cheesy to say that. Technology-wise, this is the best camera in most circumstances most of the time, but for us, it truly is. Like I said in the beginning of this video, Raymond, staunchly in the Nikon camp, mind you, came back from the launch event in New York saying, that leaves the Alpha 7 Mark IV, the joint strike fighter of cameras, as far as I'm concerned. The way that I was able to pick it up and work with it without a lot of training or experience speaks volumes. If this sounds like a Sony commercial, believe me, I'm as surprised as you are. You will see him shooting with the Z6, Z7, and Z50, and we love those and our older Nikon DSLRs, along with a number of other cameras that we'd like to own because we enjoy them. But sometimes he's shooting with those because the Sony is in my hands. <laughs> and it's in my hands because I get my work done quicker and easier with it. It gets out of my way. I don't have to work around it to get the shot I want. I'm only limited by my creativity and level of effort. Now, I don't always need the most technologically advanced camera in my hands. Sometimes I just want to use a fun camera that produces solid results like many other brands. 
And I know that there are a great many of you out there that feel the same way. But DP Review called the Alpha 7 R4 their camera of the year last year. And we can see why. This is a workhorse. Now, remember that it doesn't take photos for you. <laughs> you need to learn the camera, work on your technique, make the effort to be out when and where the exciting photo opportunities are, whatever that means to you, or else this super high-tech and expensive camera is pretty well worthless. I mentioned towards the beginning of this review that I wouldn't discuss all of the specifications, and I didn't. It would take days to discuss the ins and outs of every spec, feature, and customization that you can make on this camera. Like pixel shift multi-shooting. I haven't looked into that at all yet. And I am interested to dive deeper into animal eye detection with different animals. But what did I leave out today that you would like to hear more about? Do you have a certain feature or use for the camera that I didn't cover in this video? Let me know down in the comments below because you just may see a video on it soon. I also didn't address all of the questions that I received from you about which camera is better. This video is already really long, so I'm going to separate that topic into another video on its own. So look for that soon. There are a slew of other videos coming your way. We have the, the new microphone that got released with the camera. I know some of you mentioned being interested in a review on that, as well as some of the lenses that we have. We will get reviews together on those. And I have a video filmed, but not yet edited, where I share how to update the firmware on the Alpha 7 R4. And you will definitely see more from my entire Sony kit in future videos on other random topics like astrophotography. So before you go, links in the description include my next photography tour. I'm very excited about that. I will add links to the Alpha 7 R4 and the lenses and such that I used. They are Amazon affiliate links. So thank you to those of you that use any of those links to purchase anything on Amazon. Seriously, if you use the Alpha 7 R4 link to get to Amazon, but then purchase toilet paper, <laughs> I still receive a few cents and every little bit helps to keep this channel up and running. But you can see the price of the body and different kit options when you are at that link. I'll also add a link to my gear reviews playlist in case you want to see more reviews of Sony and other brands of gear. And make sure that you subscribe and like this video if you found it helpful at all. And thank you for watching.